It always brings me a little bit of joy and a little bit of entertainment, I think, to see how fast everyone sits down after a song, to be like, okay, I get to be comfortable again. It just, it entertains me a little bit. And I think that's a fantastic thing. Like, yes, you don't always want to be the first person sitting down or the first person standing up, but to be comfortable in God's presence and to allow yourself to do what makes you feel right in the presence of God is a phenomenal thing. And we kind of observed this this morning. Today I'm talking about building habits with Jesus, the intentionality behind that, and that can sound like a really overwhelming topic. How am I meant to be building habits with Jesus instead of for Jesus? How am I meant to be building habits? Are there things that I'm doing wrong? But it's not as overwhelming as that. We are in the season of Lent at the moment. Lent often comes with giving up something or taking up something, and that is often if you're choosing to give up something, is something that has become a habit in your life, a good one or a bad one. It's intentionally trying to put aside this thing that you will constantly be reminded of. We have dozens of tiny little habits in our lives that we do without even noticing. Think of how your morning normally goes. Personally, I set my alarm 10 minutes before the alarm that I actually need so that I have enough time to wake up and go, oh, I really should have slept more. I'm gonna sleep for five more minutes and then get up to my second alarm. I do that every morning. That is a habit, intentional or not, it is a habit that I have developed into my life. I then throw myself out of bed and I go, all right, time to drink some water, I'm gonna stand up now, I'm gonna open my curtains and open my windows. They're the first things that I do every single morning. You probably have them too, whether you get up and do what my mother does and walk straight to the kettle and turn it on, or do what my dad does and get up and go straight for the bathroom. That's just the Bible, it's fine. Um, we all have little habits and when those things become out of sync, we then have to consider them more and more. I also have a habit in the way that I choose to write a message. And this is relevant to you because it has been thrown out of sync this week and has mean, meant that the way that this morning has gone has been slightly different and has thrown me off a little bit. Normally when I get up to, well, I'm writing the message for church, I like to have it done by Wednesday because then I can get it to Rob who needs to know it so he can write in the right things. And I don't really want to annoy Rob because he does so many wonderful things for us. I need to get it to a pastor so they can check it and I'd like to give them the time that they need to do that. And then I would like to be able to look over it again and get to the point where I can say it without having to stand here going like this. Because that wouldn't be super fun for you guys. This week that's not what happened. And that's okay but it meant that I then had to adjust the way that I was functioning. Which means this morning, I woke up and I went, okay, I've written the message, I've had it checked, and I am just trying to make sure that I've got my head around the order in which I'm speaking so that I can share it with you all. Which meant that my other tiny little habits kind of fell to the wayside a little bit. There are several things that I need to consider coming here in the morning. I go, okay, am I going to be there with enough time Am I going to look presentable enough to be recorded and up on our YouTube for forever? And am I wearing something that has pockets for my mic pack? As you can see, that one I did not succeed in doing this morning. <laughs> and so I will hold it. But that means that I now get to hold my notes and uh, also try and hold the Bible verse that we're going to be referring back to because I had to prepare, prepare the message later this week, which means I couldn't get it to Rob in time which means I can't look at it and pretend that I know the Bible off the top of my head. We have these little habits, and they all fall into our lives in so many phenomenal ways. And they fell into Jesus' life as well. So I'm going to bend down to pick up the Bible verse. In our Bible verses this morning, it was a lot about Jesus and Israelites talking about sin and praying for a saviour, and then that saviour coming and knowing that it was time. And that seems like probably the easiest thing to talk about this morning, that there is a God that loves us and he does. And he loved us so much that everything led up to that point. But the bit that stood out to me the most is actually in the Hebrews verse. It's 
uh, Hebrews 5, 7 to 8, where it says, in the days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up both petitions and supplications, so urgent prayer, with fervent crying and tears to the one who would be able to save him from death. He was heard because, he was, because of his fervent submission towards God and his unfailing determination. That's from the Amplified Version, which has a couple of other words in brackets that kind of explains a little bit further what this means. Jesus constantly, throughout his life, we see him come to the Father. He will be with a group of people and then step away to pray. He will constantly turn the conversation back upwards to God. And we, in the church, try to be more that way. But how do we get to that point? How do we get to the point where turning to God is the first thing on our mind in trial and in triumph? It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easily. But nothing does at first. Sometimes we find ourselves in the pits of despair and all we can think is, oh, I really need God in this moment. And that's phenomenal. We identify that need, but how do we go about it? This verse gives us our answer. Jesus, throughout his life, falls into reverent submission towards God. He turns towards him with determination. And then further down in verse 8, it says that he learned and through his obedience, through what he suffered. Jesus learns through obedience and falling towards the Father and through all of the things that came along with that, the good and the bad and the suffering. Which if you've ever tried to build a habit in your life, you'll probably recognize. When I was oh, 16, so in year 10, remember, so it would have been what, 2017 for the rest of, no, 2016 for the rest of the world. Adelaide has had a massive blackout. It went for about three days, I think. I had no idea. I was on outdoor ed camp. I had no power, and so I wasn't aware that this was going on. But there were massive storms at this time, and I'm trying to paint a picture for you so you know where it is. On outdoor ed camp, it was decided that at the end of that, we were to learn how to surf. I'm excited about this. My cousins know how to surf. I'd always wanted to know how to surf because it's being on top of something that you probably shouldn't be on top of. Being on top of so much power and being like, yeah, this is fun. It looks fun. There was a TV show when I was younger about surfers and it just looked like a good time. And so I was excited for this. And the day comes and it is stormy as anything. The waves are choppy, the sky is dark and it is raining probably not ideal conditions for learning how to surf, or learning how to do anything, but learn we did. And that took determination. It wasn't, okay, I'm going to learn how to surf, and I'm going to go and do it, and this is going to be a breeze, and it's going to be easy. I fell off of that board more times than I stayed on that board, and for the first eight, nine, ten times, I don't even think I got up. I think I was like, yeah, I'm going to stand on this board, no, I'm still lying here. How do I get my legs under myself properly? All right, my legs have to go under, and then I have to stand, but be holding the board so I don't fall off. And now I have to stand up, and then I need to lean forward and control where the board is going. But the waves are choppy, and I don't know how to do that, and everything's going well, but for other people, but not for me. Am I doing something wrong? No, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just hadn't learned how to do it yet. It takes constant determination to build those habits for something to come against you, a wave to knock you down and for you to go, you know what? I didn't get it right that time. I'm going to go back out and I'm going to try again. It takes effort. Jesus, to get to the point where he was at the Father and being fully human, had to have taken effort. It's not written down. It's not documented hugely. But that had to have taken effort for him to constantly turn to the Father and be like, this is my first response and this has become natural now. We all want that kind of help from God, to turn to him and be like, this is my need, help me. And him to go, of course I will. 
And he will, but sometimes we don't know how to ask. Most of you, I assume, because everyone I know drinks coffee, hand up for me if you actually consume coffee regularly. Yeah, most people, yeah, you don't have to be ashamed. Coffee is good. It actually has some really phenomenal chemicals in it that are good for you. Um, I won't bore you with that now. If you're learning to make coffee at home, it is a bit of a learning curve. I had to learn how to make coffee for my grandparents because I don't drink it. And so it was like, okay, can you make Nan a coffee? It's like, absolutely I can, I think. Boil the water, coffee grounds, hot water, stir. That has to be right. That's how you make tea. It's not. There is a learning process there before it becomes instinctual. After I had learned how she made her coffee and the way that she does it is she loves the instant little coffee things that I just don't understand. Not the pods, the tiny little granules. And you put it in and then she puts in a little bit of cold water and then she puts in a little bit of warm water and then she adds in her milk. And that's the way that she does it. And that is natural for her to do because it's the way that she does it. I, learning how to do that, had to put a lot of effort into thinking how to do those steps properly because it's not something that I do every day. We had a fun discussion this morning before a lot of you got here. When I got here, I walked into this room and most of the chairs were not set up. I walked into here to finding people setting up the chairs, which is fine. It happens. Chairs aren't always set up. But we're setting up the chairs and this side is getting set up and, and if you take a moment to look around you now, you'll notice that this side of the chairs a bit neater than that side of the chairs. We were setting up these side of the chairs and we realized that we had spaced them different to this side and went, oh no, there are eight rows of chairs on that side and seven rows of chairs on that side and maybe people will notice and maybe we should have done better. And so Chelsea and I setting up the chairs, but let's run a little social experiment. Let's see what happens. We're going to leave a massive gap in the middle of the two sets of chairs. And so we had three rows and then four rows and went, you know what? We're just going to see what happens. We have our habits in our life without realizing it. This morning, I was talking to the band and I watched people put chairs in those spots because that's what is normal and what happens. You all have a space that you sit in this church. I think, in complete honesty, if I removed the first three rows of chairs from here, or even the first, no, it is the first three, and put them to the side and left everything exactly where it was, it wouldn't put anyone off. You'd be like, oh, there's more space in front of me and that's weird. It's not gonna change where you're sitting. It is habit, it is something that you do naturally. You were either a child once or you've, well, you were a child once. And in that process, we learn things. I'm not Greg, and so I can't talk about Teddy like he's my own grandson, but I'm gonna talk about Teddy anyway. Kids have this amazing ability to learn things and have the determination to do so. You learn to walk and then at some point, I don't know what happens, but kids go, I have the need for speed. I need to be able to move faster. Has anyone ever seen a three-year-old on a scooter? It is terrifying, breakneck paces, and they've learned how to do that. And then at some point you go, okay, scooters are no longer the most practical option. I'm going to learn how to ride a bike. And that takes a lot of practice and a lot of processes and you start with training wheels and then you take off those training wheels and then you try and try again. And then we grow up some more. In Adelaide, the age of driving is 16. And so when you're 16, you are then allowed to start driving once you've proven to the government that you know what the road laws are. You don't know how to apply them because you've never driven, but you know what they are theoretically. You then have to do 75 hours of driving over a year in a variety of conditions before they'll even accept the fact that you might be competent enough to drive on your own. 75 whole hours. And as a 16 year old, I thought this was unfair. I was like, I've been driving camping for years. I know how to drive. I would like to be able to drive. The freedom that that would bring. 75 times, at least, I had to go out with my parents and that's assuming we drove for a whole hour. Learning to drive a car has so many different things going on. It is different every time. You get in the car, you're like, okay, I know what's coming. And it's different. 
And so we make everyone practice at least 75 times before we'll even entertain the possibility that they can do it alone. And once you pass that test at the end of those 75 hours, you've proven that you, can, you have done those hours. You then get to drive by yourself for three years. You don't have to be alone, but you can be. You do three years of P's, one year of P1s, two years of P2s. And then at the end of that, they consider you competent enough to be a fully licensed driver, which means you now get to go faster and you can go at whatever time of the day that you would like. So at this point, we've done 75 hours over one year and then three years of P's, and that's four years of practicing this one thing. And at the end of that, that kind of becomes instinctual. You don't have to get in the car and be like, okay, all right, mirror, mirror, seatbelt, keys, feet on the right pedals, turn on the car, is it in the right gear, now I'm going backwards, now I'm going forwards. It doesn't become a thing that you think about in those steps, it becomes something that you just do. It then takes two more years before you're considered competent enough in this area to be able to teach that to someone else. You cannot teach someone unless you've been a fully licensed driver for two years. They will not accept that number in the logbook. They just won't do it. Because they need to know that you know how to do the thing that you are doing well. From beginning to learn this thing to the end of it, where you're considered good enough to teach someone else is a six year process of doing something every single day. Or often, mostly every single day. It's something we practice so much that we don't even think about the fact that we're practicing it. We do it because we need to. So much that it becomes natural. But if you are in the middle there, you haven't quite got to the point where you're comfortable driving, where you're not at the end of your L's, you can't drive on your own, and you still need to get somewhere fast. If you put a 16-year-old in a position like you need to get to your friend's house as fast as you can, they don't even think about, oh, I can take the car, because they physically can't. They haven't gotten to the point yet where they're good enough at that. They will take their bike. If they need to get there alone, that is the way that they go. Why? Because that is instinctual, because that is the habit and the thing that they know how to do. Going towards God is like that. And I've said a lot of things that are a lot of different examples and a lot of different ways of saying the exact same thing. Building habits with God, for God, towards God is a process. It's not something that we can often do alone. If we look at it like driving a car, you do two years alongside someone else consistently. So if you're trying to build a habit, you pick someone to do it with. You go, okay, I need to be held accountable to this thing. I started going to the gym, it's easier if I go with someone else, right? You do that until it becomes easy, and then you test yourself by doing it alone. And then eventually you become good enough to then guide someone else through that process. If we take it into a faith-based context, reading the Bible can be difficult. There are so many parts of it that we think we're aware of and then we read it more and we're like, oh, I found a new thing and oh, that's thrown everything into spiral and I didn't realize that that was there and I thought I knew this. We read stories to kids from the Bible. They're familiar with it. But if you're starting to do devotion, starting to intentionally spend time with God, it's easiest to do it with someone else. Me and one of my friends, we make sure that we do a devotion together once a week because it's a way to fit it routinely into our lives. And in that process, that's her learning how to look at that and read that and how she best engages with that and me doing it with her because I have been doing it for slightly longer. And now we're at the point where we can do those things separately because there has been enough time in there practicing alongside someone else. And then eventually there comes a point where you're so well versed in that area that you can then guide another person. It makes turning to God a lot easier when we practice it with other people, where we look at our situations and go, hey, did you notice God in that moment? Because I know that I definitely did. 
You did that thing and it was really cool and I saw God's light shining through that. And then they start to recognize that on their own. And then when times of trouble come, God becomes so much easier to see. When that emergency happens, you don't have to pick the bike because you know how to drive the car. You know how to turn to God and to reach for him. It is a process and not an easy one, but it's one that becomes so worth it. And so I encourage you, when looking towards God and how to spend more time with him, and if you're seeking him, look to Jesus and his example of knowing how loved he was by the Father, practicing that and then turning to him in every moment. If you go about your life consistently and purposefully at first, being get to the end of your day and be like, okay, where did I see God? Because it might be hard to see him now. That thing becomes natural. It becomes as easy as breathing. It's easy walking to turn on the kettle in the morning. We don't do this alone, which I think is phenomenal. We have community around us. We have other people that we can ask and be like, hey, how did you do that? But most importantly, we have God there backing us every step of the way. It takes determination. You get knocked down, and there is always someone there pulling you back up. The love that is there is all-encompassing, that no matter how many times you think you failed, he's there for you still. All right, I think now we have another song. <laughs> 